Philippians chapter number one. Actually, let's go ahead and read more than one verse. Verse number five, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now the Apostle Paul here, writing in to the church at Philippi, verse number one, you find out that Timothy's with him as he's writing this epistle. We discover, verse number five, that there is a fellowship with the gospel. There is a relationship between you and the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. That relationship is one that must grow in order to be effective. Your relationship started, or your fellowship started, on the day you got saved. Technically, we could say it started before that, when you heard the gospel, but the first time that you really had fellowship with it was on the day that you got saved. Before that, it was strange to you. It was unknown. You knew about it, but it didn't mean anything to you. On the day that you received it, that's when it became alive. That's when it became something potent in your life. Before that, the gospel was just a story. It was just a preacher getting up and telling you about some Jew that died over 2,000 years ago. It didn't mean anything to you. But after that which we received it, it became alive unto it. It became life to us. Did not Jesus promise that he would give life and life more abundantly? That life was a result of the gospel. Then we see in verse number 5, that it says your fellowship the gospel from the first day until now. What was that first day? The day you got saved. And what is now? Now is the present. It's not talking about the day that he wrote this. It's talking about from the first day that you received it until now, the present. The present does not end. doesn't matter if you read this verse the day after the Apostle Paul wrote it or a couple of thousand years after you wrote it. From the day you received it until now, and every time you come back to it, now is today. Right? It's just as alive today as the first day that you received it. Your fellowship is just as real today as it was the day that you got saved. Right? That opportunity for fellowship, always available. Notice he doesn't put an end on it. He didn't say from the day that you received it until the day that you die. No, because the day that I die here to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. That fellowship continues for all eternity. There is no end date with your fellowship. Once you're in, you're in. And you're in forevermore. But, verse number 6, he says, being confident in this very thing. He's saying from the day you received it until today, you can be confident in this very thing. In other words, without a doubt. You can take it to the bank. It's not going to change. But what is that thing that will not change? That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That is a lot to unpack there. I don't know that we're going to be able to get through all of it. But we do know that God is the God of completion. But he didn't go back to Genesis chapter number 1. Thank you, Brother Ray. I usually don't need it until after Sunday school anyway. But thank you. Go back and read Genesis chapter number 1. He didn't stop on day 5 of creation. No, he didn't stop until everything was completed. And then for our sake, he took a day of rest. Symbolizing that six days is enough to create everything. Six days is enough for you to get everything you need to get done, done throughout the week. Right? God is a completionist. He's not a destroyer. No, He is a God that begins and continues. He establishes. Is not Jesus our solid rock? Wasn't it said that Christ being the stone cast aside of the boulder, God made chief of the corner? I mean, what? Once it's settled, you can't move that cornerstone. Then you base all the other stone's positions off of the cornerstone. What do we say? He completed the work at Calvary. Didn't leave it half done. Didn't leave it to where it was contingent upon us. No, our salvation was completed long before we ever came along. 
So after that which we receive our salvation, He promises that thing that God started in you. He's going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, what's that? That's the day of completion. When Christ comes back, raptures the church out of here. Those which in glory still haven't quite figured this out. You know, Bible doesn't say it. Means I don't need to figure it out. But just something that I think about. But Bible says that when Jesus comes back for the church, those which were dead shall rise first. That God's going to take their old body and make it into the new body. But what do they got in heaven right now? I don't know. May just be the form of their spirit. I don't know. Don't know what it is. But I do know that they're going to get completed on the same day that we get completed. What's that? The day of the rapture. We'll get a body like his. We'll have to go stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But after that, they were completed in him. I'll have a body fashioned like his. Right? When we come back with him on them white horses, we look like him. We don't look like us anymore. So what's this work that he's talking about? Well, it's not salvation, because your salvation was completed when you received it. You're saved forevermore. Can't be changed. Your name's written down in heaven. Your name is in the Lamb's book of life. Can't be taken out. Unless you start messing around with his word. He said you take away from his word and take your name out of the Lamb's book of life. That's the only contingency on it. Forever settled in heaven. So it's not talking about your salvation. What's it talking about? It's talking about, in verse number 5, your fellowship with the gospel. The work that he started in you was that new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. Your fellowship is because he took something that wasn't like himself, put himself in it, and now he can have fellowship with it. He made you into a new creature so that you could have fellowship with him. He gave you the Holy Ghost so that you didn't have to go through a man in order to communicate with God. No, you could communicate with God directly. The Bible says that when we pray, it's as if we step into the very throne room of God. And God himself speaks to us through the Holy Ghost, through his word. He cut out all the middlemen. Our salvation, our position, we're already seated in heavenly places. That's been completed. Our conversation's recorded in heaven. God sees us as if we're already there. So what's he talking about this work that he started? It's that new creature. Did not the Apostle Paul write that as babes desire the sincere milk of the Word of God, but he would that he'd be able to teach them meat from the Word of God. There is a growth process in that new creature. In fact, Jesus even said in the parable of the sower that some received the Word, the seed, but some were choked out by weeds and the cares of the world. Some because they had stony hearts. It took root. They got saved but it never matured into the finished work of the new creature. But a very, very small amount found good ground, good soil. What are those people? Those are the people that allowed God to perform, perform the work that He started and continue it. It's the work of the new creature. Anybody that tells you Jesus is still working on your salvation, mark that man as a liar. He already finished salvation. It's the same for everybody. Nothing needs to be added. We're not waiting on anything. Now, you saved, you saved. But as far as being a new creature, He made you into a new creature, but you've got to mature as a new creature. And you can't do that on your own. Now, I'm not an airplane pilot, but the airplane pilot that takes you guys back from St. Lucia and come back up here. Right? That airplane pilot, he didn't make the plane. That he, in fact, that may be the first time he's flown that individual plane. They switch planes all the time. Right? All of his faith is that what he trained in, everything that he knew about it, 
I mean, but Jim can tell you, a lot of training, a lot of qualification hours, but then even after you become a pilot, you know, you don't get to fly every day. Trip out, captain may be flying. Trip back, co-pilot may be flying. They rotate. They may get off of one plane, get back on to a different plane in order to fly out. That, there's a whole work that has to go into that plane taking off. It's not just the pilot saying, all right, let's give it gas and let's go. Right from the time it touches down until it takes off again, there is a work that must be completed. They got to take the bags off. They got to put new bags on. They got to take the trash off. They got to put new snacks on. Right? They've got to do the refueling of the plane, but that involves a whole bunch of math based off of how many people that they know we're going to be on the plane then depending on which seats they sold they may have to tell people excuse me can you get up from over here and sit over here so that the plane will be balanced right, and they can do some of that with the fuel on balancing the plane but there's a whole work because there's inspections right, there are reports that have to be filed before the last pilot gets off and the next pilot gets on saying that well this felt a little funky you might want to inspect this on the outside of the plane right, a whole work has to be completed before that plane can take off again. Right, well, as Christians, right, what are we? We're not even the pilot. We're not the co-pilot. We're nowhere in the cabin at all. Right, we're just in one of the seats in the back. And God said, I started this work. Right, I'm the one that made this airplane. I'm the one that put the fuel in this airplane. I'm the one that knows where this airplane needs to go, what storms it needs to fly through, right? All the hardship and turbulence that you don't want. He says, I got it. All I need you to do is let me do it. Right? If we hit turbulence, I don't walk up to the cabin and say, excuse me, Mr. Pilot Man, I believe that we can avoid some of this turbulence if we were to change vectors and this and that and the other, and if we were to, you know, increase altitude to this or decrease altitude to this. No, I sit in the back and say, well, as long as that guy in the front isn't freaking out and having a panic attack, I think we're okay. That guy next to me may be freaking out. He's not a pilot. I really don't care about his opinion. Now, as long as the pilot's okay, I'm okay. Right? It's when the pilot starts saying, uh, there might be a problem here, that's when I start getting a little worried. Right? But our pilot, he's the one that started it. He's the one that's going to finish it. That's not contingent upon what I, but if I go up to the cabin and I start knocking, Lord, I don't know that this is necessarily what we need to be doing. He won't finish it. He'll ground the plane and say, why in the world are you trying to tell me to do what I only know how to do? He's the one that saved you. Long before the foundation of the world, he conceived your salvation, planned out your salvation, and knew how he was going to deliver salvation to you. Even then, he knew the relationship that he desired to have with you. I mean, didn't Job say he knew him in the womb before he formed him in the belly? He knew you and he knew the relationship that he desired to have with you and he took everything out of the way preventing you from having that relationship with him. Our fellowship with the gospel. But see, part of the responsibility of that fellowship is fellowship. He wants to create that new creature. In me. Well, what's the end goal? That I look like Christ. That I am a joint heir with him. You know what that means? In order to be found acceptable by the Father, I've got to look like the one that was altogether lovely. I have to become like him. That's why he became like us, so we could become like him. But see, that work says, verse number six, being confident in this very thing, that he which has begun a good work when you got saved, He gave you the Holy Ghost. That was the beginning. God indwelled you. God chose to, part of the 
triune God decided I will seal that person's soul I will become a part of them until they become like us now, everywhere you go every thought that you have right? every time you overeat and you feel miserable God experiences all of it because he's in you a part of you so that you could become a part of him that's the completed work God already sees us there thankfully he doesn't see us as we are he, he winks at our ignorance right he robed us in Christ's righteousness so that he wouldn't have to look at our unrighteousness right there's a lot that went into the beginning of this work but the completed work that involves growth God did not intend you to go to heaven at the same maturity level as the day that you got saved no he began a good work in you but he also plans on completing it he didn't want us to stay the way that we were the day we got he wanted us to mature he wanted to continue the work so that he can complete the work notice the word that the apostle Paul uses in verse number 6 that he will perform it that's a promise you know the only thing that can stop a promise of God the will of man some things God says I will do that means God's going to do it but sometimes God's promises are I will do if the promise is that he will continue the work in us if we let him go back to verse number 5 for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now how did that fellowship begin or begin well I'll tell you how it began you got saved but what really happened when you got saved you had to deny self and accept Christ you said because God through the gospel and through the conviction of the Holy Ghost revealed unto you that you were a sinner you know what that meant you weren't enough you realized I'm not enough to get me to heaven I'm not enough to be acceptable in the eyes of God I'm not enough even to merit one blessing one moment of grace or one drop of mercy from the hand of God only thing I'm good enough for is hell but then you also realize that the one who is acceptable unto God offered unto you that you could become like him you had to deny self and accept Christ as being the one that could make you acceptable unto God now granted most of us we didn't get into great theological you know breakdowns on the day that we guess but what does this really mean no we just knew we was lost and we needed to get saved that's what we knew but what did we know we knew that we weren't enough but Jesus was so we asked him to save us right now after we study the word of God and we start breaking down some of the doctrines of God we can really get into what happened on the day of our salvation all the things we didn't know we were getting but that we actually did receive as a result of our salvation right fellowship was one of them right but this work this new creature that was another but if we really break down what happened on the day you got saved you had to say Lord I'm not enough I'm just going to believe that you know what you're doing and that Christ was enough and we can go over to the book of Romans where it says that you know, salvation with the mouth confession is made what was that confession I'm not enough I believe that Christ can save me and that he will which is why I'm putting my faith into the fact that he said whosoever come whosoever meant me whosoever meant you for God so loved the world the world means all right? and I believed that I was a part of that all so I came and asked him to do what he promised he would do that with the mouth confession is made Lord I'm a sinner I'm not enough but with the heart man believeth unto righteousness that's that faith the day you got saved you denied self but you also believed 
You believed that Jesus would do what He said He would do. You believed that Christ was enough, even though the world says that He wasn't. The world claims He is just a prophet or a good man. No, He was the Holy Son of God. You believe that the holy took on unholy. He became our sin so that He could pay for your sin debt. I wasn't there to see it in person. But through faith, through the Scriptures, the Holy Ghost took me to the place called Calvary and showed me what Christ did for me, and I believed is enough. It was a rejection of what I knew and a step of faith in the things that were unseen. Right, that's really what happened when he got saved. You say, did you say all that, Brother Jordan, when you got saved? No, I remember exactly what I said when I got saved. Right, I was over a concrete step in our garage at the time, and all I was praying was, Lord, please save me, please save me, please save me. You're saying, well, how'd you figure all this out? This is, this is after the fact. It's going back and studying. Right, all he asked for was a childlike faith that we believe on Christ. Right, he took care of the rest because he knew that it was too big for us. Right, I didn't even have to do anything to get saved. He already paid for it. Then through the Holy Ghost, he did that supernatural surgery where he cut out what I used to be and replaced it with himself and made me a new creature then and there. He said, what do you say? It wasn't contingent upon me. All I had to do was believe that he'd do what he said he would do. Right, so when we get to verse number 6 he began that good work in us and he will continue it until one day he completes it well if he started it and he will continue it where am I in that equation I'm not there Nowhere does it say that he started it and as long as Jordan checks these boxes, he will continue it. No, he started it and he's the only one that can continue it. But if I try to do it, all my flesh will fail me. If I get involved, pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before the fall. If I think that I can do something to impress God or if I can meet the expectations of a holy God God's going to stop doing it because it's not being done the right way you know what the right way is I get on the plane and I let the pilot fly nowhere in there do I ever ask the pilot if he needs any help if the pilot comes on and says put your seat belts on I put my seat belt on if the pilot comes on and says hey we're getting ready to experience some turbulent wind up here y'all might want to sit down nobody's allowed to move around the cabin you know what happens I sit down I'm not moving around the cabin in fact I hate the fact that nowadays I've only realized this over our past couple of family vacations used to I can get on a plane fall asleep wake up when we land I don't know what has happened since that point but I can't do that no more I want to go to sleep cannot go to sleep it's not because I'm nervous or stressed out. I don't know what it is. I just can't do it. I think it's because I don't have my CPAP mask in me. That probably has a little bit to do with it. But I've thought about Jerry Riggin. Wouldn't he just open one of them air vents and then suction cup something on there? I could have a CPAP mask on plane. But I don't think that they'd like that too much. And I don't think they're going to let me use one of them oxygen masks that come down. That, yeah, that's not going to go well. What are you saying? Used to, I got on the plane, I didn't worry about any of it. Still don't worry about it, I just can't go to sleep like I used to. But I'd get on there, I'd pass out, and when we wake up, all right, it's time to keep going. I wasn't worried about what was happening when we were in the air. You say, you trust that pilot enough? Well, probably not, but I know all the tech that they've got in the cockpit, right? All the fail safes, all the redundancies that are built in to make sure even if the pilot does mess up, that there's something there to catch him. Right, he has to mess up real big in order for something real bad to happen. Right, what are you saying? 
But why in our Christian life do we want to be up in the cockpit all the time? Why can't we just sit in the back and enjoy the ride? If I need to know something, He's going to let me know. About the Holy Ghost is going to pull on the cords of my heart when I'm in here, and He's going to show me what I need to know. Right? It may not be an announcement from the captain, but he may show a video from them drop-down screens where there's a message that he's given to a pastor that he wants us to really listen in on. That it's not about what I hear from the cockpit that makes me think that he's continuing to work. No, he put us on that old ship called the old ship of Zion, and he set sail. It's never stopped sailing ever since. Right? He's continuing his work. The question is, is I'm allowing him to continue the work that he started in me. He said, like, what is that work? Well, it's the new creature. So really, what is God working on as a new creature on each and every one of us that he wants to continue? Right? We could start with the fruits of the Spirit. Certainly you should have more of a capacity today to love, to be gentle, to be long-suffering, to be temperate, to be meek, to be patient. Right, You should have more joy today than you did yesterday. But see, so many Christians are trying to find ways to get more joy in their life when really they've just got to let God give them more joy in their life. They've got to let Him continue the work. You had no responsibility. There was no requirement when you got saved in order to be saved other than the fact that you asked to be saved. By faith you accepted Christ. That's all of your involvement. The only requirement for God to continue to grow your fellowship with the gospel is that you allow Him, you ask Him, you step back and say, Lord, I believe you can do whatever you need me to do. Now again, what's that going to take? You're going to have to deny self. Self likes being in control. Self likes being in the pilot seat. Self-likes thinking that we're more than we really are. You don't believe me? Go look and see what ego does unchecked. Look at the world. Believe in all the things that they think are true. Why? Because they think themselves more than they actually are. They think that they discovered all these things. No, God discovered it when He did it. And it's just taken us roughly... 8,000 years to even start wrapping our head around some of the things that God's done. Plus the half that hadn't even been told in heaven. Now they're trying to figure out what dark matter is. Who cares? Right? They're trying to figure out how big the galaxy They keep claiming that it's expanding. That it's still getting bigger. But I've got a theory on that. See, if I say something here, it takes a while for it to get it to the back door. It's not really, you know, easy to see. If the, but if y'all were standing in a field and I yelled and you were far enough away, I'd finish talking before you heard it. Right? But when God said, let there be light, wherever God was when he said that, it just started spreading out from wherever God was. When God said, you know, let there be stars and let's make some planets, Right? I mean, John chapter 1 tells us that the Word was that without Him was nothing made. God decided between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that they were going to do it, and the Son said, well, let it be done. So wherever God was when He said that, it's, it's, you can't stop the Word of God. It just continues. And we finally got telescopes to catch up to it and realize that even though He said it a very long time ago, it's still going. I don't have a problem believing that. Because I believe that, just like I believe in the perpetuity of the church. You know why I believe the church will continue? Because God said it would. You know why I believe I'll be saved? Because God said that it would be saved. And when He said it, that continues through all of time and eternity. I don't have a problem understanding any of that stuff. You know what I do have a problem with? Denying self. They gave us all the same measure of faith. 
That little bit of measure of faith that he gave us is enough to say, I believe God more than I believe me. I believe he's more capable even though it makes me uncomfortable. You know when God really gets down to doing work is when we get outside of where we're comfortable and we let him take us to where we need to be so that he can continue that work that he started in us. You know how you get more patience? Brother Randy, all the old Sunday school classes. You know how you get more patience? God's got to get to the end of your patience and teach you new patience. He's got to get you to where all that you understand about being patient, that's not enough, and he's got to teach you more. You know what that involves? Being stressed, being angry, right? Learning to wrestle those emotions within you. You know where temperance comes from? You've got to learn that you getting angry and how hot you can be, but then at the same time, how cold you can be and realizing that the only way God can use you is if you're in the middle. Be angry and sin not. But yet at the same time, there's a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Doesn't matter how hot or how cold, I, I can still in Christ be the same. Doesn't matter what my emotions are doing. You know how you learn to be long-suffering? God's got to get you out into a place where you learn how to suffer for a long time. How you can become used to it. Not in the fle flesh always hates pain, hates rejection, hates all those things that Christ said that he endured for us and that we should strive to endure for other people. Not for our sake, but for their sake. Suffering is never fun, but yet he did it for us. And part of that new creature is, is that I will embrace pain on my part for the good of somebody else. You know how you learn to be more long-suffering? You've got experience more suffering, more intense suffering, so that when you have to stand, having done all to stand, stand there for, like we heard on Wednesday night, when you have to stand, you know that you can endure it because God's taught you a little bit about suffering long. Those aren't enjoyable things all the time, but He's promised that He will continue it. You know what that means? None of the learning experience, that fellowship with the gospel, none of it is too much to destroy us. In fact, it's all meant to make us better, to make us stronger, to make us more like Christ. He will continue it but we have to allow him to. I've got to say, Lord, I don't know what I need to be more like Christ. All I know is that he promised that he would make me more like him in that new creature. So Lord, whatever it takes, take me down that road. I don't know which road we're going to go down today. I can tell you this, I haven't made it to that road yet that Paul and Silas took down there after they'd gotten the tar beat out of them and thrown into the inner prison at midnight at all the you know if I'd just had myself worn out had the skin peeled off my back at midnight by the time it's all said and done I think I'd be ready to go to sleep or pass out from the pain one or the other but yet they said God's got a reason for us to be here. Let's pray. By the time they got praying, or got done praying, what does it say? They started singing. I haven't been down that road yet. But you know what I do know? In order for him to continue the work, I'm going to have to go down that road one day. Because he's no respecter of person. Whatever he taught them, he'll teach me if I allow him to continue that good work. I fear that so many Christians today fall out, give up, reach a point that they feel comfortable, and they stop, and that's why the government was allowed to close so many churches. Because they didn't know much about standing. They didn't know much about fighting. They didn't know much about realizing this right here 
And this right here, this is more than routine. It's more than a seminar. It's more than a self-help class. No man shall not live by bread, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Man shall live in the new creature by fellowship with God. And part of me being me after I got saved, granted, I know you can worship anywhere, but it's something about when you worship with the brethren as God intended it to be. That this haven was not only, it's vital. I don't think enough Christians understood that. You know why? Because a lot of them didn't allow him to continue the good work. They got to the point that they were satisfied with the good work that he had done and they did not desire for that good work to be continued. He will. That's what your Bible says. Will. So if it doesn't happen, why is that? Because of me. That immersion will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know what that promise means? Doesn't matter if around AD 60, okay, granted, it's about 27 years after Jesus went back to heaven, roughly. 27 years after Jesus went to heaven, he's saying, until Jesus comes back again, whoever in verse number 5 had a fellowship with the gospel received it and they became a part of the family of God he said until Jesus comes back it doesn't matter who you are doesn't matter where you are doesn't matter what you're going through he's going to continue this work until he comes back for the church you know what that tells me as long as there's still the church he's still going to continue the good work of taking those that have been baptized through the blood of Jesus Christ and continue to make them into the new creature that he desires them to be. That there's no end to it. Well, there is an end, but that's called the Great Tribulation. But you know why there's an end to it? Because that's the end of the church age in your Bible. There's still going to be those that get saved through the Tribulation. It's going to be through a different mechanism. There are different requirements. But he said the church age is over. The new creature that we started with salvation, salvation, the grace age has run its course. He's saying from start to end, Christ has promised if you get in, he's going to continue the work that he started when he added you to the family of God. From the time you got in until the time that you see him in glory, he has promised he will continue what he put in you. The only thing that can stop that is that I don't allow him to continue. I mean, I really don't know. Because, you know, I haven't been around the entire time. But, I mean, if we had, you know, the knowledge of God, and I doubt that God uses Excel sheets, but in my head, see the progress chart of how far God performed the work of the new creature and people I wonder what the furthest has ever been I wonder if it's somebody like the Apostle Paul but see the book of Hebrews tells us that there are those that in the hall of faith their names will never be recorded this side of glory will never know who they are but they had great faith I think about those in the dark ages that were tied to the stake had their family slaughtered before them then they were began to be set on fire and they said this can all stop at any point all you got to do is renounce Jesus and they'd go out singing the praises of Jesus wonder how far that guy made it wonder how far God had continued the work of the new creature in his life and then I think how far have I got? 
can't imagine suffering or enduring some of the things that people throughout history have endured. But then at the same time, we think that we've got the worst that it's ever been because we are selfish creatures. We have a bad day. We think nobody else had a bad day that day. Right? Our bad day was the only bad day that happened that day. That's how the carnal man wants to think. Carnal man wants to react by doing whatever we want to do to make our bad day not as bad anymore. Then we think about, you know, spiritually. Every time I have a bad day, I've tried to get into the practice of saying, well, I wasn't under such affliction today that I started sweating as it was great drops of blood. My body didn't hemorrhage today because I had such a bad day. But yeah, Christ did that and then continued to the Hall of Praetorium. That was the start of his bad day. We're not even getting to the fact that he had the iniquity of all mankind laid upon him and his fellowship with the Father was cut off. Not even getting, it just, my body didn't suffer such stress, such affliction today, such spiritual warfare that I started sweating blood. Not that bad of a day. Even on my worst day, I have the benefit that Christ did not have on Calvary. That I always have fellowship. God can't not be associated with me. That's how Christ was able to say He'd never leave us nor forsake us. Because He endured it so that we wouldn't have to. We'll never know a day without the Holy Ghost after we get saved. But he said, there's a whole lot that's been done for us to have this relationship. But how many of us actually use it for its intended use to become more like Him? How far do we make it down that new creature route? How much do our thoughts resemble the thoughts of Christ? How much of our attitude resembles the attitude of Christ? How much of our perception resembles the perception of Christ? I truly believe that the new creature, once you, I don't know what certain point you get to, because we never arrive. He said he'll continue to work until the day of Jesus. Until I either meet him in glory or until he raptures us out of here, he's got more to do. But at what stage do you get to the point where it's not about me anymore, it's about others? When every waking thought that you have is, Lord, what would you have me do for somebody else? The only time I think about me is when I'm asking the Lord, what do you want me to do to help others? Did He not say, take no thought for tomorrow? That your heavenly Father knows what you have need of. He'd give you all your needs. Just like He takes care of the sparrows. Why? Because they're His. He made them. He'll take care of you. So what should our thoughts be concerned about? Well, Lord, what would you have me do instead of taking thought for tomorrow? What would you have me take thought of? What would you have me go and do? Go and say? When does it stop becoming about us and becoming about Him and coming about them outside these walls? These are just things I think about. But he said he would continue. You know, that means if I'm not there today, I can be at some point. I just got to let him keep working. That's the beauty of it. If I fail him today, I know he'll continue to work tomorrow if I let him. It's not contingent upon me. It's contingent upon him. I'm going to fail him. I'm going to fall short of the expectations of God but see the beauty is is that as long as I keep coming back to a point where I say Lord I know I failed you again but I also know that you promise that you will continue this good work that you started in me I know I didn't meet the standard today but Lord I know you'll continue working in me help me continue to not rely upon me but allow you to do the work 
Because as long as he's working, that means he's got something for you to do. He will continue the good work that he started because there's always a work for you to do. It's not based off of how perfect I am. No, he'll continue the work. Whatever we need to become for God, if we get out of the way, he'll make us into it. To fulfill the call that he put upon your life, he'll do it. Not a problem. The only problem is, will I allow him? Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.